I'd say 99% of first-time visitors to Japan make at least one of these noob mistakes. So let's start with the smallest errors, what I like to call sushi size slip-ups. So on your trip, what are you going to do first thing in the morning? Because if you've answered take a shower, you're doing it wrong. Why? Well, first of all, if you're staying anywhere with shared bathrooms like guest houses, hostels or capsule hotels, the showers get completely rammed in the mornings, but are dead at night. And second, if you're staying in a hotel, you might get to use an onsen or big public bath instead. But you should always use these at night because of the next mistake, which is going late to breakfast. I know it's so easy to get completely wiped out hunting down that perfect ramen restaurant or having one too many suntories as you do your best Bill Murray impression. But if you've paid for a breakfast buffet, don't wait until the last minute because newsflash, you might not find your favourite onigiris getting restocked. It's not uncommon to find Japanese guests lining up before the buffet opens at like 6 or 6.30. You don't have to be there that early of course, but just don't leave it until the very last minute. Now with your belly full of natto and miso soup, you're thinking, better get my case packed because it's time to check out. Well yes, go and do that, but don't make the mistake of trailing your luggage around with you all over the city, even if they're small carry-on size cases. I see so many people doing this and it's completely idiotic because A, almost all hotels and guest houses will keep that luggage for you for at least the rest of the day. B, you can also whack your case into luggage lockers at almost every railway station. And C, if you find all the lockers are full up, just go to tourist information. They'll tell you where they have extra lockers and sometimes they'll actually keep your cases for you right there for free. And speaking of staff, that's next because one of the most common mistakes first time is make is not letting people help them. Believe it or not, tourist attractions get a lot of foreign visitors and you're not going to be the first non-Japanese that staff have met. So let them do their jobs and explain to you what ticket to get or when the attraction closes because I can assure you there's nothing more dehumanizing than having Google Translate shoved in your face and being ignored as a person. Now the next mistake is what about 95% of first time visitors do and that is stay in Tokyo for the entirety of their trip. Now don't get me wrong, there's a ton of incredible things to do and see in Tokyo, but if you think the capital gives you a good flavour of the rest of the country, I'm going to ask for what you've been smoking because you really really need to get out and see somewhere else on your trip. And if you're heading for Kyoto or Osaka at the start of your trip, don't make the mistake of flying into Tokyo. You can get to Kyoto in just 80 minutes from Kansai Airport, whereas if you're coming from Narita, it's going to take you three and a half hours. Now all these mistakes so far have been relatively small, so let's look at the errors that are going to waste your time, money and energy, what I like to call blowfish size blunders. For the first one, let's rewind back to your plane landing. You've cleared immigration, picked up your case, what do you do next? Well if you're anything like about 90% of travellers, you'll be telling me a long list of things to do. Pick up a SIM card or Wi-Fi router, collect your JR Pass or bus ticket, buy a Suica card and get some cash. But rushing around straight off the plane isn't any fun with jet lag and it's a mistake you can easily avoid if you do a bit of planning ahead. Because let's start with picking up rail passes. You can easily waste a ton of time at the airport waiting in line at the JR counter, doing this and then going on to reserve seats. So instead, just buy a separate ticket into Tokyo or Osaka and collect your passes there the following morning. You'll usually find that the queue is so much shorter, if there even is one. This way your plans are less screwed up if your plane arrives late and you can get to your accommodation much quicker. But you're probably thinking at this point, that's a great idea Andrew, but what about the internet? I need to pick up that pocket Wi-Fi router or a SIM card at the airport because without Google Maps I'm totally sunk. But do you have to? Because if you've got a reasonably new phone, you can get an eSIM, meaning you don't have to faff around and pick up any physical items. You can just download an app, 
choose the plan you want and activate it and that's your internet ready to go. And you can get that installed before you even leave home. I put an affiliate link for a company that you might want to check out in the description. So go and use that if you want an eSIM and you also want to help me make more videos like this. There is one more mistake that you can fix before you arrive in Japan and that's to do with money. Now I really couldn't give a flying monkeys if you want to pay for everything by credit card, cash or IC card just as long as you always have an alternative in case one of those isn't accepted. A lot of people rave about IC cards and how credit cards are now fine in more places but the fact is nobody is going to refuse cash. So bare minimum order some yen before you leave home, pick it up at the airport and put it in a money belt because it'll get you started and you'll have some backup money right there. Now the next mistake is kind of medium sized because if you don't do this you're going to spend more on transport than you really need to. But I know it's hard to avoid it because I've done it myself a few times. I'm talking about checking for discount and special passes. It really does pay to do some research before you leave home, especially for the rail passes. But once you're already in Japan, just head to tourist information because the staff there will tell you all about the greatest discounts and city travel passes that you might have missed. So here's where I get slightly controversial because I'm going to tell you you're making a big boo-boo if you completely avoid taking taxis. In case you didn't know, cabs in Japan are flipping expensive. For example, a distance that costs 220 yen on the subway in Kyoto is going to cost almost five times that, at least 1,000 yen by taxi. But although taxis are pricey, it makes a lot of sense to use them in two situations. First, if you're traveling in a group and can split the cost, the journey might well be cheaper than using public transport. The second time is if you're going across a city and you just don't have time for complicated transport routes. Now if you've done some trip planning already you might have made this mistake. You make a list of all the places you want to see in Tokyo or the cities that you want to see across Japan. You get here and start your tour and before long you realize that some of those places aren't quite as close to each other as they might have looked on the map. I've seen a lot of ideas itineraries where people are spending entire days getting from city to city. But this also happens when you make unplanned excursions too. Japan is much bigger than you think, you know. And although you might assume that you can get anywhere in Japan quickly because of the Shinkansen, the fact is you can't because many places don't have it. So don't make that mistake because many places almost require slow travel if you want to visit them. But equally don't fall into the trap of only visiting places that have a Shinkansen connection. There are so many destinations in Japan I can think of that are only accessible by express train or bus and if you limit yourself to Shinkansen cities you're going to miss out on so many incredible and unique sites and experiences. I hope you're finding this video helpful so far because I'm trying to make your trip to Japan the best it can possibly be. And if you'd like to get more tips, recommendations and news to help you get planning, go sign up for my monthly insider email. It's completely free and you'll find out about events and places that nobody else is talking about. Go find the link in the pinned comments. All right, now we're into the big time error zone, what I like to call Godzilla sized gaffes. These are mistakes that are going to make you look stupid, make your trip harder or potentially ruin it completely. I should probably have made this section sound a bit more serious like earthquake size errors but anyway here goes. So as you might imagine from looking at other videos on this channel I travel a lot in Japan and that means I run into other tourists from time to time. And one time earlier this year I was waiting in line at the ticket office and just for fun I decided to listen in on how one foreign tourist handled the conversation with the staff. Now I won't say where this person was from because well I don't really know but this guy rolls up in front of the staff and greets him with a big friendly good morning. I don't know about you but I'm pretty sure even I know how to whip out Google Translate and push the button so it can speak for me if I really can't be bothered. Seriously though 
have some manners and just learn the basics before you get here. Now, although it's good to know a few simple phrases, Japan does serve English speakers really well with things like signage, transport announcements, and leaflets you can get at attractions. But don't fall into the trap of expecting good English support everywhere because you're setting yourself up for a major disappointment. There's considerable variation, not just across the country, but also within the major cities. But if you do your best with learning the basics, using Google Translate, and being patient with people, you can get a really long way. And speaking of major disappointments, a couple of years ago, I went to Hokkaido and stayed at Lake Toya, and I was really excited about visiting the newly opened Ainu Museum on the South Coast. So I made my plan, went to the station, got on the train, and when I arrived at the museum, I found out that I couldn't go in because it only accepted advance reservations. When I went back to the station, I was sure that the station master took pity on me for this really noob error. But don't let this be you. Check ahead and see if the attraction you're visiting needs advance reservations because it's becoming increasingly widespread these days. This next one sounds like common sense, but common sense usually being, well, uncommon, this mistake is understandable. And I find myself doing this. I have a list of like five things I want to do on a given day and I get up at the crack of dawn and rush through breakfast to get to the first place as soon as it opens, dash around, hurry on to the next place and the next and the next and collapse in a pile at the end of the day, utterly exhausted. Here's the deal. Less is often more. You can rush and rush and see as much as possible, but will you have time to savour the carp in the pond or the herons in the river? Probably not. Don't cram your itineraries to bursting point. Slow down and thank me later. And while we're talking about things bursting, let's address the problem of luggage. What are you going to bring to Japan? Because if the answer is an enormous suitcase, then I have one thing to say to you. Don't. You don't want the major hassle, and trust me, it is a major hassle of lugging it around. It's going to slow you down dramatically. Japan is the home of small because space is at a premium. Leave it at home and bring something smaller. The best way to make this work for you is simply to use the washing machine at the hotel or hostel that you're staying at so you don't need to bring tons of clothes. Okay, I'm going to get serious now because avoiding this mistake can save you some serious cash if anything bad happens. How do I know? Well, because a few years ago, my friend came to visit me. And while he did have a big suitcase, which really made me laugh, he didn't have the one thing he needed when I had to take him to the hospital during a stay, and that is travel insurance. Well, no, actually, he did have travel insurance from the Andrew Travel Insurance Company. Yes, that's right. I had to pay for his treatment. Now, thankfully, this wasn't a mega money level treatment, but my friend actually didn't have enough money to pay himself. And while I'd like to be your travel insurance company and make sure you buy coverage before you travel, the best I can actually do is point you toward one company I've used in the past, which is linked down in the description. And this brings me to the final mistake. This is a trap that I see almost everybody falling into at some point. It's when you take somebody else's trip. Taking someone else's trip? What on earth am I on about? Well, let me tell you. Once, when I was living outside Japan, one of my colleagues came to see me and said, Andrew, I'm going to Japan soon. Do you have any ideas about where I should visit? And you can imagine that I had a couple of suggestions. So they went off and made a plan and took the trip. But when I bumped into them a couple of weeks later and I asked them how it had gone, it turned out that they'd just gone to pretty much all the big tourist traps and completely ignored all of my suggestions. Now, I'm not going to lie, I was a bit disappointed about this, but not actually because they hadn't taken my advice. It was because of their reasoning. It basically came down to, I can't visit Japan without seeing X, Y and Z because I want to show my friends that I went there. Well, you went to Japan, what's the problem? So if you're making plans based on what you're going to tell your friends and family or what you want to post on your Instagram, just a suggestion for you. It's your money. Use your imagination. Take your own trip. You have my permission, not that you need it, to skip anything that looks like a tourist trap 
and just do something entirely different that you find interesting. And if you're looking for some unique ideas for your trip, just sign up for my insider email I mentioned before. It's a really easy way to level up your Japan trip in just five minutes a month. It's completely free and I load it up with all my handpicked suggestions on where to go and what to see. If I find some new discounts or flight sales, I'll tell you about it in the email. I also put in tons of tips based on my experience of traveling to every single prefecture in the country. And you can also send me your questions that I'll answer in future emails or videos. So if that sounds good, the link is in the pinned comment. And when you've done that, make sure you're packing the right things for your trip in this video up here. But for now, see ya!